Mike Ounsworth will kick off his presentation about the standardization efforts that are taking place in the Internet Engine Engineering Task Force. So, Mike is a software architect at Entrust, and uh, welcome, Mike. Test, test, good. Thank you, Paul. So yeah, as Paul introduced, I'm uh, heavily involved in the IETF work. And I've managed to get my fingers involved in most things post-quantum. Um, summarizing all IETF post-quantum activity in 45 minutes is gonna be a bit of a trick, so this is gonna be a dense and fast-moving presentation. I apologize in advance, but let's, uh, let's do it. So I'm gonna start with the couple of different problem statements, sort of why is this so hard in various flavors, um, as, uh, as well coupled with the scope of work that the IETF needs to undertake, some of which is in progress, some of which is yet to be started, some of which is nearing completion. And then I'll go through just a couple of case studies, having sort of having introduced why this is hard, I'll introduce a couple of case studies of how these problems are being solved and sometimes easily and sometimes with difficulty. And then I'll conclude with my personal research area, which is the hybrid and composite PKI migration strategy work. So let's do it. First, who am I? Why am I here? Um, I am, by day job, I'm an AppSec tester at Entrust. I have this strong hobby of PQ research and crypto architecture work. I'm heavily involved in IETF. I'm currently the author of eight active internet drafts covering mostly PQ and a little bit of key attestation stuff. And uh, I'm a massive nerd. But since Paul invited me to give this talk, you guys get to sit through a massive nerdy presentation. <laughs> Disclaimer given, let's go. <laughs> All right, what is the scope of work that IETF has to undertake here? And I'll start with this slide, which I quite like. So NIST is at the core, the nucleus, if you will, of this quantum evolution. And NIST is gonna give us the core primitives. And then, as far as I'm concerned, then the real work starts, where this, this halo, this shell of other standards bodies needs to take the output of NIST and roll it into the protocols that we all need to then implement and adopt. So I'm gonna focus here on the IETF piece. So what, what is it that needs to change? Well, IETF owns a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff that you've heard of. HTTPS, TLS, TCP IP, DNS, and a lot of stuff that you probably haven't heard of unless you're in the PKI industry, for example, and you've you know, worked with SCAP or CMP. And almost all of these, in one way or another, will need to be updated to accept post-quantum crypto. The good news, though, is that there's a lot of interdependency, and especially in the last sort of 15 years, a lot of the newer protocols are built with a lot of modularity involved. So the good news is you can split this list in half, and the stuff on the left actually does define its own crypto and therefore needs to be updated. The stuff on the right uses one of the other things in a modular way. So that's really convenient. Once you update TLS, HTTPS gets it for free and then DNS over HTTPS gets it for free. The other one here that's interesting is CMS, cryptographic message syntax. That's a core cryptographic building block and it's used in a surprising number of places. So if we make a good change in CMS, then it sort of propagates for free to a lot of other protocols. Okay, that's good news. Where within the IETF, sort of organizationally, is this work happening? So this is split over a number of different working groups. LAMPS owns all of the PKI and SMIME stuff. IPSec is, is Ike VPN protocol. TLS obviously is TLS. The JWT and CWT groups, OpenPGP. Those are sort of the core groups where a lot of this discussion and evolution is happening. There's also a brand new working group that just started, PQ, PQIP, which I get the honor of claiming was my name suggestion. And that group doesn't isn't going to actually do anything and that it's not gonna publish standards. It's a, it's a central group to sort of coordinate 
post-quantum evolution. Um, you know, everyone's got to do hybrid key exchange. Let's make sure we're doing it in a consistent way across all the protocols. It's that, that sort of coordination work. Um, and there's a couple protocols that IETF has specs for, SSH and Kerberos, that don't really have an active working group. Um, so unclear where there's a, those are going get, to get updated. It's this sort of, if I put this in here for reference, if you want to subscribe to mailing lists and follow, you know, a bunch of nerds yelling at each other, these are the mailing lists that you want to subscribe to. I'll also mention that we've had a very successful hackathon on getting PQ into X509. We did our first meeting at the last IETF in November. We've been meeting monthly since then. We're going to do another full weekend session coming up later this month. We have a GitHub at the bottom where we have a actually quite quickly growing repository of test artifacts. Uh, we've got four open source PKI implementations, OpenSSL, Bouncy Castle, uh, LibPKI as well as five proprietary vendors who are participating. And at this point, we're trying to build a full N by M compatibility matrix. Everyone can read everyone else. And so far, it's going really well. Very few interop problems. We're all able to, we're all able to parse, parse and verify each other's search chains. So this is actually a really strong success story, sto success story so far. And finally, I'll do a bit of a shameless plug. Uh, these are all drafts that either I personally or my, co my colleague John Gray over there, hi John, um, are authors on. So we're, I mean, we're really heavily involved in a lot of these drafts. And I'll point, there's one here that I'll point to. Under the CFRG category, the Entru, draft Fleur or CFRG Entru, uh, Renee mentioned that there's still some patent uncertainty around Kyber. So this Entru draft, we're hoping that the world's lawyers, when they you know, finish reviewing the NIST patent terms that everyone will be happy with Kyber and then we'll be able to just kill this draft. But if not, we have a draft for Entru ready for IETF to use Entru instead of Kyber if we decide we're not happy with the patent terms. Okay, so that's the work that we need to undertake. Why is this work so hard? So the first one, and this is largely harking back to Renee's talk, is there are so many knobs and dials with the new crypto. You don't just pick RSA 2048 and be done with it. You're going to have to make many choices. And we'll compare here to the, the RSA and ECD, ECDSA migration that we all mostly lived through and the SHA-1 to SHA-2 migration. RSA to elliptic curve was sort of an easy migration because we sort of just didn't do it. <laughs> SHA-1 to SHA-2 was painful. I mean, we're still, in some weird edge cases, still haven't made that migration yet. And it's been how many years? And that was comparatively a very easy migration. You didn't have to revoke root certificates. You didn't have to update implementations. It was just changing the signing algorithm at the end entity. And that turned out to be frickin' hard. And here we're faced with, I mean, the, the PQ migration is like orders of magnitude, like gonna be like 100 times harder that, that question for Renee about do you have to upgrade hardware, I mean, yeah, you, you, you probably do. So, yeah, let's, let's be real about the scope of this problem. Um, that first sub-bullet there, algorithm and parameter selection, I mean, that was half of Renee's talk, was showing all the trade-offs. You have to have size and extra computation somewhere. Do you put it in the public key? Do you put it in the private key? Do you put it in the signature? Uh, do you do you deal with state? Do you I mean you know there's so many place the complexity has to be somewhere, but where you put that complexity is almost free choice. You also have to make choices. Do you do a hybrid? I'm using the the UK NCSC's terminology here, PQ slash traditional hybrid, or do you go pure PQ? Do you do a mixed PKI? Uh, Sebastian is going to give us a talk later today on mixed PKIs. Um, you have to implement these new crypto, so we're all facing the buy, build, or open source question with where we get our implementations from. And navigating these trade-offs is not easy. I mean, we all need to build that intuition, right? If I say I'm using RSA 512 with MD5, we all shudder. We all know what that means. We all have that intuition. And I think we all have to build that intuition with the new stuff, and that's not, that's not going to be free. That's not going to be easy. Okay, so I'm gonna drill in a bit to the, the hybrid piece. So a post-quantum traditional hybrid is one of m several techniques we're developing that, that merge two crypto systems together in some way. 
reasons you'd want to do that. There's strong security reasons. Renee mentioned, you know, implementation bugs. This new stuff is complicated. People are bound to make implementation bugs. We're bound to have CVEs and Oracle padding attacks and whatever that need to be fixed. If you do a hybrid, you sort of gain some security and robustness against CVEs. You can also use hybrid systems to ease your migration problem. You know, you have old stuff that needs to talk to new stuff, and hybrid is generally the way to bridge across that. For example, the SHA-1 to SHA-2, Microsoft code signing used a hybrid approach. They actually signed the binaries with both SHA-1 and SHA-2, and the client could choose which signature to verify. So this hybrid migration approach has been tried and tested with the SHA-1 and SHA-2, and it, you know, it works. It gives you the backwards compatibility you want. There's also you know, a strong regulatory question here, and I'm using the word regulatory fracturing in that different governments have, are taking different postures on hybrid. Uh, Germany and France you know, are very pro-hybrid. Inissa and Etsy are sort of ambivalent, and the Five Eyes countries are, I'm not gonna say against hybrid, but definitely discouraging it for reasons that make sense, for reasons that aren't conspiracy theories, and I'm happy to chat offline, but you know, this, this sort of lends the question of what do you build? If you're trying to build products to sell to all markets, you know, this is making it complicated to figure out what you're gonna build and deliver. Then there's timelines, still on the topic of unclear and fractured regulatory environments. I think we've all, I'm sure everyone in this room has seen the CNSA 2.0 document that came out last September, and these, I'm sure like me, everyone's sitting there going, that's, that's, real, that's real soon, is that, is that me? Do I need to do that? And that's sort of the first question is, you know, do I need to do that? The, what exactly is software and firmware signing? I think it's, it's pretty clear that they, they really want the chipset ROM and secure boot people doing this, but when I check in code to Git and I sign it with my SSH private key, that is technically signed software. Does that count? Do I need an LMS-based SSH key or I can't sell to DOD? I mean, probably not, but it'd be nice to get some clarification here. You know, this is the uncertainty piece. Um, that's a bit of a ridiculous example, but a slightly less ridiculous example is what exactly counts for PKIs under that software and firmware piece? Does that include the publicly trusted Windows code signing PKI? Because if so, that's gonna be a heavy lift to get onto LMS for you know two years from now. We heard from Renee that the standards, I mean, LMS exists today, but I don't think we have CAVP test vectors for it yet. So I don't think you can FIPS certify an LMS yet, correct me if I'm wrong. So we're in that yellow period for software firmware signing, but I don't think anyone has a FIPS module for that yet. Um, and then there's other pieces, all right? So the CAs need to be on LMS, but what about the OCSP responders? What about the timestamping authorities? Getting those onto LMS is actually a lot more complicated, and I'll go into that in a few slides because those are public services. You can't easily restrict how many signatures your timestamping authority does when it's a public free service. So how do you choose at key, key gen time how big to make your key? And what happens, if, what happens if it's exhausted? What happens if you run out of signatures on your timestamping authority? And then of course the biggest question here is, well, 2025 is basically tomorrow. You know, are we, are we gonna get there? You've got hardware implementations, FIP certification, these are gonna be new environments, so web trust audits, distributing routes, browser root stores, I mean, all of that's gotta happen. For that blue line, that's all gotta happen in that little bitty tiny window from when the specs come out until they want it live. Uh, you know, I, I'll <laughs> stop getting myself into trouble with the US government here and take a step back, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty in what we're gonna build and when it needs to be delivered by. So let me go in, I'm gonna drill into that second bullet, the LMS piece, why LMS is so difficult to implement. And the first piece has to do with private keys and lifetime of these keys. You know, this, this may look like a lot of signatures, a billion or a trillion, but have you ever stopped and counted how many signatures your prod environment produces? If you run a public large scale time stepping authority, do you actually know how many signatures you spit out in a year? You know, this is a question we probably mostly haven't had to think about. And then, you know, building on that, this concept of key exhaustion. So the recent PKCS 11 spec has added 
a query, so you can ask the hardware how many signatures are left on this key. And when the key is exhausted, the hardware will return this key exhausted error code. Sorry, I refuse, I will not sign that. And we're gonna have to grapple with the implications of this. If your issuing CA runs out of signatures, then you cannot produce more CRLs, and that's a violation of your contract, right? You're required to produce CRLs until your issuing CA expires, but if you expire your key, you know, you're in trouble. So these are all operational concerns and that we're gonna have to deal with at scale. So that's sort of the first point there, is choosing the lifetime number of signatures at key gen is, is, you know, is a bit of a magic trick. There's also private keys. You know, a sort of naive LMS implementation has gigabyte size private keys. Uh, those aren't gonna fit on smart cards, for example, so people who currently use a smart card for their code signing solution, you know, nope, not anymore. And then there's this question raised by SP800208, that's the LMS spec, that is very clear that you may not back up an LMS key, and that's to do with issues of, of private key state reuse. So it makes sense why this requirement is there, but that means, you know, that's a fundamental shift in how we manage disaster recovery in prod environments. You know, we're used to just, just taking backups of our prod keys and in disaster recovery, we just restore them. We're gonna need to rethink all of those procedures when we're dealing with an LMS-based PKI. Okay, so that's sort of broadly the, the, the problems. Let me go into one more. I'm gonna deal with one more problem, and this is, fair warning, this one gets a bit deep into crypto. Here's how Diffie-Hellman works today, and I'm gonna use throughout my presentation this, this ECDH, meaning anything that's sort of Diffie-Hellman shape, elliptic curve or, or finite field, and we call this this is, this is both encrypted and authenticated. We refer to this as a 0 0.5 round trip authenticated key exchange, 0 0.5 RTT, AKE. Basically, if Alice already has Bob's public key, maybe from some previous interaction, so that, that dotted arrow doesn't need to happen, then Alice can do an elliptic curve key exchange, extract the secret, encrypt her document, fire it all off in one shot. Crypto and document sent. Bob can turn his phone on, get off the airplane, turn his phone on later, it's there sitting in his inbox. That's cool. And this is, this is beautiful, we take advantage of this all over our cryptographic protocols, and now that we're losing it, we're realizing just how special this property was. So the new chems all have this shape. So Alice still needs to get Bob's public key. She then runs that through a chem. You'll notice Alice does not have a key pair in this model. So it's already different from elliptic curve. It's also different from RSA key transport in that Alice doesn't get to choose the secret. The secret will fall out of the chem. She provides RNG, so it's, our Alice provides provable randomness, but does not get to choose the secret. And so those two properties together mean that this is a lot more tricky to engineer into protocols. If you, this is not an authenticated key exchange because Alice, there's no way to prove here that it originated from Alice. So if you want an authenticated key exchange, you've got to do a chem in each direction. So here's what this looks like, and I ripped this from the, the Kyber paper. This is the authenticated key exchange with Kyber, and it's, it's, it's a full round trip, and this is just to set up the crypto. She has, we haven't actually encrypted any content yet, so if Alice then wants to send the message, that's gotta be a third flight. So we call this a 1.5 round trip, AKE, and I'll note also it involves three calls to the chem encapsulate primitive. So we're actually making three calls to the chem primitive and a full round trip and a half to actually do anything useful. And that means Bob can't be on an airplane. Bob's device at least has to be online to do the crypto setup. Okay, so there's the problems. How are we solving this? So I'll go through, I've got a few case studies here. X509 and OpenPGP are sort of in lockstep, so I'll do them together. TLS is in some senses solved and in some senses not even started. Um, CMS is a really nice sort of example of a win. And then CMP is an example where we can do it, but it's not pretty. So let's start with OpenPGP and X509. Here is the list of crypto algorithms that are going to be supported in OpenPGP. I'm starting with OpenPGP because it's a little bit more straightforward. This document is co-authored by BSI and ProtonMail. And in keeping with the BSI policy, these are all hybrids, which I find fascinating. OpenPGP will not allow you to use dilithium by itself. You can't. 
They're going to bury it. You can choose your elliptic curve if you want a brain pool curve or you want a NIST curve. They're giving you all the curves, but you must use elliptic curve with dilithium. Same with Kyber. And that's, a, that's an interesting and bold choice. I like it. We are trying, oh, the other, sorry, the other thing you'll notice here is there is no RSA. And that's because OpenPGP has already deprecated RSA. You already cannot use RSA with a modern up-to-date PGP client. So that, I mean, the OpenPGP problem statement is in a lot of ways much simpler than the X509 problem statement, just because PGP is a much more constrained environment. This set of use cases are a lot more limited compared to X509, which is used for all sorts of wild and fantastic and weird things. Which means, you'll notice my, this, this, this draft, the equivalent draft in, in for X509 has my name on it, so I'm the lead author in choosing the hybrid combinations for X509. And it's a much more difficult problem statement just because the set of use cases for X509 is so much more complicated. You break down to the small embedded devices, you know, up, up to the web trust size CAs. Everyone wants something different. So we're currently up to 14 signatures and 12 chems for the hybrids plus all of the pure algorithms. And I'm, I'm sure at the next IETF that's gonna get argued bigger. So that's the status of just choosing algorithms. Let's talk about TLS. So the, the encryption part of TLS is pretty straightforward, and this draft is very mature. This is the TLS hybrid design draft. It's pretty mature. I think this is going to get standardized more or less as is. Um, again, all hybrids, which is an interesting choice. So you can do Kyber with your choice of elliptic curve, and that'll, that'll encrypt the, the TLS session. Okay, cool, easy. TLS signatures, not easy. This one is a mess. I've ripped here a picture straight off Nick Sullivan's Cloudflare blog. The problem, and I don't wanna get too into the, the details here, but the problem happens in that green box, that step two, the server hello. That, that flight of messages has to include the second half of the Cypher Suite negotiation, it has to include the Kyber key exchange, and it has to include the certificate, server cert, and the signature. And for TCP technical congestion window MTU reasons, that entire green box has to be under five kilobytes. So we can probably get a dilithium cert key and signature to be under 5K, but not when you add the, the, the Kyber ciphertext, the Kyber public key, and a signature over the Kyber public key. There's, this isn't gonna fit in 5K. And that means that we get packet fragmentation at the TCP level, which doesn't really matter to, to me as an end user, but it matters a lot if you're Cloudflare, because that extra packet fragmentation in the setup is you know, really problematic for network engineering. So the TLS working group hasn't really started working on this problem in earnest, and I don't even think there's rough consensus on how they're gonna try and solve this. I mean, option one is you just ignore it and deal with packet fragmentation. Option two is we ask NIST for you know, unreasonably small and insecure parameter sets, which Renee has just told us is not gonna happen. <laughs> and step three is, well, we totally do surgery on the TLS handshake and we move the certificate to the end. And the, for TCP reasons, the farther down you go, the more bandwidth you have, and that solves the fragmentation issue, but it also turfs three decades of security analysis if we're totally re-engineering this thing. So there is no good answer check back in a year and see if we've made progress on this. Okay, let's talk about CMS. So I mentioned CMS, cryptographic mesh syntax. It's the underlying layer of all sorts of stuff. It shows up in SMIME, it shows up in Windows code signing, it shows up in PDF signing, it shows up in all sorts of other good places. Um, and this one's actually a really strong story. Those are all places that don't particularly care about bandwidth. Uh, email attachments are usually 25 megs. Um, your Windows binary you're signing is probably several hundred megs. If you have an extra couple tens of kilobytes of crypto, nobody cares or notices. So signatures, the only real problem with signatures is size, and we don't care about that here. So signatures fall in cleanly. The chems don't perfectly fit. Like I'm, with those pictures I mentioned earlier, Diffie-Hellman isn't quite the same shape as a chem. But with CMS, we don't need it to be an authenticated key exchange. We just need it to be encrypted. And that's because with CMS, you'll have an encryption cert and a signing cert. So you're doing the encryption and then you're signing over that with your signing cert. So we get authentication externally from the chem. So we don't need to worry about that problem either, which is nice. 
So there is a draft in front of LAMPS, the CMS CAMRI draft that my colleague John Gray is an author of, and it just proposes a new message type. And you'll see this message type is a bit busy. There's a lot going on in it, but it's actually surprisingly straightforward. Um, so getting chems into CMS, easy. Getting signatures into CMS, easy. I might be as bold as to say CMS is done. It's ready for PQ. Bring it on. It's ready. Easy. Last one I'll talk about is CMP, the Certificate Management Protocol. It's probably the least well-known of the protocols here, but uh, most people in this room probably have one or at least have used CMP. And so here we're talking about end entity certificates doing their own lifecycle management. Enrollments, key updates, rollovers, um, self-authorized self revocations. And you need a chem key to be able to authorize its own update or authorize its own revocation. So here we really do need to solve the authenticated key exchange problem. And compared to the ECDH flow, we had to add a whole round trip. So this went from being a two round trip protocol. Here I'm showing the key update case. This went from being a two round trip protocol to a three round trip protocol. And I'm personally so sorry for all of you who have to implement this and have to run CMP over crappy networks. Like I'm so sorry, but this was completely unavoidable. We've also totally changed the processing logic for, for message types two and three, to, or sorry, three and four in order to accommodate the fact that chems work a little differently, so, so you'll have to re-implement your, your, your key update processing. And this is coming, we're actually hoping, John, I think we're hoping to get this out even published later this year, right? This one is actually, this one doesn't need to wait for NIST because we're just defining message types. We're supporting chem in the abstract, and if Kyber's not standardized yet, that's okay. So this is CMPv3, which will hopefully be published later this year, and it's going to take some work to implement all the chem stuff because it doesn't work the same way that the RSA and Diffie-Hellman stuff works today. And I'll put this one in. I know I'm really short on time, but Signal's cool. I like Signal. It's not an IETF protocol. Anyone who studied it knows that the double ratchet is really heavily built around the properties of the Diffie-Hellman authenticated key exchange, and this is, like, not going to work with chems. I know there's a lot of really smart people who are trying to figure out how to get chem, a chem-based signal, and it's, I'm gonna have a little funeral service for signal in my backyard one day, because it's gonna, it's not, it's not, there's no way it's gonna be as pretty and elegant as signal is today. Okay, and in my sort of dying minutes before I take questions, let me talk briefly about hybrid approaches. And this one, this one really is my research area. This one's my baby, so I felt like I needed to put it in here. So you want hybrids. Let's say you're, you're, you're building your PKI. You want to do a hybrid approach. I mentioned before you have security reasons to do that in case, you know, to, to protect against implementation bugs and CVEs in the new crypto. You also may have migration reasons. You may need old stuff talking to new stuff in some complicated way that has to deal with the details of what you're using certs for. And for either reasons, you might think that hybrids are attractive. And there's sort of fundamentally three ways to do that. The first is parallel PKIs or multi-cert. And that's the mode where, okay, you've got your, here in this example, you've got an RSA 2048 PKI already. Great, it's useful. You've already distributed it, your, cli your clients know how to process it, your, your implementation of RSA has been hardened for decades. Awesome, useful. Don't throw it out, let's keep it. Let's pair it with a new PKI, and we call it parallel because often the obvious way to do that is you literally mirror it. Your roots, your intermediates, your end entities all just get duplicate certs in, in the new PQ PKI. Everyone's got two certificates. You use them together. Everything's parallel. The second approach is called composite, another set of drafts that bears my name. And this is, this is the direct equivalent of what the OpenPGP group is doing. So composite is where you say, no, you can't use dilithium by itself. You must use it with elliptic curve, or in this case, you must use it with RSA. And this is the sort of the just to prevent against, here you don't get any backwards compatibility. This is strongly for security. This is preventing against your, your, attack, your, your um, implementation bugs. And then the third approach is the ICERA hybrid catalyst, which is in the ITUT, X509 update from 2019, so that is that is standard with ITUT. It is not standard with IETF. It got dropped uh, due to patent concerns, but I think we're all 
super happy that ICERA has released those patents to the public domain last October. So this is now back on the table with no, no patent encumbrance. And it puts all of the post-quantum stuff in non-critical V3 extensions. So a legacy client will see this cert, see that there's tens of kilobytes of weird garbage data in some non-critical extension they don't understand. Cool, I'll ignore that. And then it looks just like an RSA cert. So your legacy clients can parse this without any issues. Your upgraded clients will go looking for those extensions, find the PQ data, and now it sort of behaves the same as a composite. Cool. How do we use this? What does this look like at runtime? So here's an example, and this slide's actually busier than it looks. Um, so here's an example of using all the hybrid tools together in one picture. So we've got our parallel PKIs, say this, this organization was already on brain pool. Great, let's keep the brain pool. We're gonna stand up a parallel PKI, and here I'm showing it as a mixed PKI, which Sebastian's gonna present in great detail on later. So I've got Sphinx at the top, because, you know, I'm not really sure dilithium is still going to be around in 20 years, but Sphinx probably will. So let's root this in Sphinx. So if I need to revoke that intermediate, I can. And then we're going to put dilithium at the bottom. So Sphinx has large signatures. That means the intermediate cert is going to be large. But okay, we can engineer around that by pinning issuing CAs. But then dilithium, dilithium means the end entities are going to be small. We're also using composite. So I'm not using dilithium by itself. I'm using burying an elliptic curve in there. And then we're going to use both of these certificates together to sign a CMS object. And this is the same trick that Microsoft used with the SHA-1, SHA-2 migration. We're going to put both signatures on there, and it becomes the client's problem to figure out which one it wants to verify. And maybe if it's a legacy client, it takes the RSA one, happy with that, doesn't, doesn't understand the second one, ignores it, but that's fine. Or if it's an upgraded client, it could just verify the PQ. And because it's a composite, you've already got your hybrid security property built in. Or maybe it wants to validate both. Maybe it wants to validate both so that it can make sure the policies match or the DNs match. Or uh, if it had previous history, like an SMIME client that wants to show you that this was a continuous email chain. So it wants to show that, yes, this is the same person because the old cert is the same cert. And then we're going to bridge across to the new one. Whatever it is that your logic needs to do, you might want to validate both for for, for business logic reasons. And so the main point of this slide is that the hybrids give you all sorts of flexibility in handling whatever the sort of niche of your PKI is. Hybrids give you lots of flexibility to make sure that those niche migration cases are, are covered and well handled and graceful. And that's, that's my talk. So the main point here is this, this migration is going to be the hardest crypto migration we've ever done. It's going to be orders of magnitude more complicated than either the RSA to ECDSA or the SHA-1 to SHA-2. It is full of these square peg round hole problems where the new stuff just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit for protocol and application reasons, like CHEMS not being the same shape as Diffie-Hellman's is the main example. It's not going to fit for regulatory requirement and timeline reasons. And it's not going to fit because, especially with LMS, we're going to have to take our operational procedures, toss them out the window, and redesign everything from the ground up to handle stateful keys. So we're, I think we're, we all need to expect that we're going to have a lot of square peg round holes to deal with. And finally, I put a short list there of places to watch for updates as this continues to evolve. So obviously the NIST PQC competition, the NCCC PQC migration project, which I know many people in this room are members of, but I'm sure would be happy to accept more either, either uh, direct participants or witnesses. Keep, keep apprised of the re regulatory bodies. NSA, ANISA, BSI, ANSI, ANSI all have, at this point, really nice PQC migration uh, guideline documents up, and I'm sure those will continue to evolve as the best practices evolve. And finally, if you want to watch the nerds argue, uh, the IETF mailing lists are all public. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So that was a great presentation. Thank you. Very informative. And we actually have a few more minutes for some questions. So is there anyone in the room or remote uh, with a question that you would want to ask uh, Mike? Please come forward to the microphone. Um, is it, uh, check if it's turned on. Is it turned on? Too far? Flip the button. 
two, one, two, one, two. Uh, there you go. Mike, awesome presentation. Um, I wanted to ask a question, being an HSN developer and having dealt with PKCS11 for a long time, when you migrate into the world of PKI where uh, you start to bundle keys, hybrid or composites, and you're dealing with that and trying to keep that under proper lifecycle management, and you're trying to deal with these keys as a new concept, not just a key, but a set of keys. Do you see the role of HSMs having to evolve in that if you do decide that you're gonna use Dilithium with RSA or ECDSA, that it's the job of the HSM to maintain those two things as a bundle? Or do you see that keeping in the realm of the applications? And if the application keep having to deal with these things, it will make the world of application development way more complicated, and it's already quite complex. So how do you see this thing, navigation, or how do we navigate to make the world safe, secure, yet you know, balancing these two concepts? Great question. This comes up every IETF, uh, near fist fights in the hallways over this topic. Um, <laughs> the, get there. Don't worry. The, I think the core of that question is, there is complexity, where do we put it? And generally speaking, we want to bury it where the experts, the HSM developers, the library developers, the PKI software just hides the complexity, and we don't want sysadmins to be able to shoot themselves in the foot with it. So I think the lower down we can jam all of that, the less people are going to get it wrong. Um, the details, of course, have to do with which kind of hybrid you're trying to use. If it's a parallel PKI, then the, the HSM, in fact, should not be aware that these Correct. are related. If it's composite or if it's ICERA catalyst, maybe they should. Maybe the lifetimes of those should be tied. Maybe, when, if you, maybe you should not be able to revoke one without revoking the other. So I think if we can get HSM support, especially for composites, I mean, if composites at the application level, we're treating that as a single key object. If that propagated down to the HSM and the HSM also treated it as a single key object, that would make management easier and more secure. There is one little trick that we haven't really addressed yet with composites, which is what if, say you've got an elliptic curve and a dilithium smushed together as a composite, what if I declare the elliptic curve to be key compromise? What do I do with the dilithium half of that key? Um, CAB forum requires CAs to check, to check key compromise lists when we're accepting a CSR. Do we have to open a composite and check each component independently? Like there's, there's some subtlety there that HSMs might be able to help with. Cool. Uh, one, one final question and I'll leave the, uh, you're also involved with the attestation protocols where you're trying to get a device to do an attestation on a key. Given the post-quantum transition, at some point those attestation might have to be signed using both classic and a PQC signature. Is the attestation evol evolution thinking in those terms, or right now we're trying to do a single key to attest another key, and we'll deal with PQC trans transition later? Another fabulous question. <laughs> um, yeah, and that also, I mean, that, that speaks directly to the um, NSA's call for 2025 secure boot chains, because key attestation is intimately linked to secure boot. So we have, I think the answer is no, nobody's really talking about how to do PQ or hybrid key attestation, and that one's actually going to come up really, really fast. So, yeah. Okay, so there were a few good questions. Are there any other questions from the room or maybe remotely? Yeah, we have a few questions remotely, and we have one here in the room. Shall we first take one remotely while you get up to the mic? Sure, yes, uh, there's many questions in the, in the chat, so we'll start with this one. Uh, how can we integrate PQC into VPN protocol? Good question. I'm not personally involved in the IPsec ME working group, the IKV2 working group, but I know that there is, there's close to a dozen PQ drafts that are fairly mature within the IPsec ME working group, so that's, that's allowing for hybrid certs, that's expanding the bandwidth of the SA um, set up phases to allow for the larger key sizes. That's 
yeah, there's that that work is actually pretty mature. So so PQ support in like V2 is actually coming along quite well. I maybe should have mentioned it here, but I'm not personally involved. Okay, so uh, let's take one more question remote, and then uh, we close the queue uh, here in the room. We have a few more questions. Uh, yes, another one is, do you see a need to change the X509 cert uh, format as well as part of the migration? I hope not. <laughs> um, we're adding, so we're adding the new algorithms. Uh, the NIST algorithms will need OIDs and they'll need encodings. Um, that, that doesn't require breaking 5280. We might add some extensions, like the, the Catalyst cert requires some new extensions. Again, those are just extensions. We're not breaking 5280. The composite stuff is just a new algorithm. It doesn't break 5280. So we've been really careful to design this stuff without having to change any of the existing 5280 stuff. So I hope the answer, I hope the answer is no. Okay, thank you. Hey, good morning. Uh, Gabriel Spini uh, from TNO. Well, I also have a question on uh, hybrid certificates, so your babies. Because uh, it looks like there's a decent chance that we're going to have actually several standards for those. So at least right now we have the ITOT or ISARA Catalyst, and it looks like we're, we might also have uh, composite ones. Uh, but they two seems, seem incompatible to me. Um, uh, so, so have we ever been in that situation where we actually have sort of like concurrent standards for uh, certificates? Do we know how to address that? Uh, I'm not issue. old enough to answer the have we ever question. <laughs> I know there's some folks in the room who've been around in the 90s who might be able to, I mean, there have been various incarnations of jumbo cert or multi-key cert um, in the early days of PKI, and those didn't progress, but they've been explored. Um, to the compatible question, I think they actually are. I think the, the Catalyst ITUT extension-based and the composites, I think actually play nicely because they solve different objectives. The composites are addressing security and only security, and the catalyst is addressing migration, and yes, it helps with security, but it's primarily for, for backwards compatibility. And the picture that I showed here, I mean, you, can, you, you could easily use composites and catalysts together. Instead of parallels, you could have a, ca a single catalyst instead of the parallel where the dilithium is actually composite. So you could put a composite, composite key as the alternative key inside a catalyst. I, I, th I think they are compatible. They do play together in interesting ways, depending on what the use cases are that you need to solve. Okay, so w one more question from the room, and then, uh, Tim, can we take your question during the panel? Uh, actually, quick comment from, uh, from Mike then. Well, come quickly to the mic then, and... Mike's already, Mike's already going to know this. Uh, Tim Holbeek did just hurt, but uh, uh, yes and no, I think, is the best answer to that question of whether we're going to change X509 certificates, um, because there's a lot of people who aren't going to want to, and uh, that's, the, you know, the correct answer is if you don't want to change uh, your X509 certificates and you want to do 5280, you will be able to do so, and we'll make sure the technology is available. Um, but we also have the opportunity to change how things work and improve some things during this migration. And we don't want to do anything that will slow it down, but I think this is actually a great opportunity to rethink how PKI works. Thank you. Last question from the room, and then we uh, move on to the uh, next presentation. Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Guillaume with Carolina Information Security. Um, I'm wondering how do you uh, intend to do CSRs for CAM keys? Well, you can't do CSRs for Diffie-Hellman keys, so I think the answer is we haven't needed to so far, we don't need to in the future. Um, I do, I'll shameless plug, I do have a paper that I did with University of Waterloo, Douglas Stabila and Microsoft Research on chem pops. So we did develop a zero knowledge proof. We call it verifiable key generation. And so you can prove via zero knowledge proof that you were the one who ran the key gen and that you can stick into a CSR. So we actually, I do have a paper out on providing it, but given that we've never needed to do CSRs for DH keys not, I think the one case that might come up is if the auth chem, the, the chem TLS draft proceeds, then we're gonna need to do chem keys at scale for web PKI, and then we really would need a CSR. But we haven't yet, so I don't know that we need to going forward, unless something changes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike. Thanks for the presentation, and please give Mike a big applause. <laughs> And of course, we will see Mike back in the panel discussion that will take place after this uh, presentation.